In this podcast style interview we recorded the other day, we dove into a live coding session where we covered some of the intricacies of programming on Windows as well as how to get started with it and an introduction to C Sharp and .NET. This is really useful for anyone who's interested in any of these topics, so let's just get right into it. Could you, first of all, introduce yourself for everyone? Sure. Uh, my name is Scott Hanselman. Right now, I'm a VP at Microsoft in developer community. Uh, but the more interesting thing about me is I've been coding now for over 32 years. I started on a Commodore 64 in the middle 80s. Uh, I've worked in C, C++, C Sharp. I helped open source .NET at Microsoft. Uh, before Microsoft, I worked in large banks and large cloud systems before the cloud was a thing. And then I worked in the Bay Area for a while with some early stage startups in the 90s. Nice. And how did you end up in Microsoft? Um, after my bank, I was a chief architect at a large uh, retail online banking company, and we were doing a lot of open source in .NET in the early 2000s, but .NET itself wasn't open sourced. So I actually came down and I met Tim O'Reilly at a thing called Foo Camp, Friends of O'Reilly. Remember O'Reilly Media? They had all the books with the animals on the front. Uh, he had a, a get together and I met Scott Guthrie, who's now the head of, of Microsoft Azure. And he was interested in doing a Ruby on Rails type thing for .NET, which ended up being ASP.NET MVC. And we've since open sourced all of .NET and C Sharp, and it runs cross-platform on Linux and Mac and Raspberry Pi and even microcontrollers. Cool. Uh, so I guess we can just dive right into it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to call you out on something, though, because I was sure. setting up my machine before we heard, started recording. And I, I'm really interested to see what you do with the footage of this whole thing, because I know you're like, what are we doing? And I was opening up my terminal, and I went directly into Ubuntu, and you were like, what? <laughs> yes. So are you, you're you not a Windows person? Uh, I, I'm a Mac person. I, I have used Windows before. There's nothing wrong with being a Mac person. Yep. See, I'm non-denominational. I love all people. It doesn't matter if you're Mac, Linux, or whatever. But this is my Windows machine that we're looking at right here. It's Windows 11. But everybody who's watching can do this on Windows 10 as well. And I was just setting this up to show you some things. So I opened up Windows Terminal, uh, which is right here. And if I bring down this up in the corner, you can see I've got the command prompt that we would call DOS in the old days, PowerShell, like an SSH into Azure. I've got some developer prompts that have my environment variable set up for different things. My main prompt is uh, the PowerShell, which is open source and runs on .NET. But I've also got Ubuntu listed right there, which is like his face. So I can click on Ubuntu, and that's going to open up another tab. And this is really Ubuntu. It's not a fake Ubuntu or an emulator. And I can actually go LSB release dash A and show you that it's actually 2204. And if you want, we can run, you know, HTOP. And we can see that I've got, you know, 20 processors and I've got, it's a full lightweight VM. But I want to point out how quickly it started up. Right. I didn't, I didn't like start the VM and then you edited the startup and then we wait for like parallels to fire up or whatever. Right. It's, it's a lightweight utility VM and I can actually open multiple ones or we could even install like right now live another, another uh, Linux distribution. So I can go WSL, which is Windows subsystem for Linux. You can see the kernel version of Linux and stuff like that. And if I say WSL, I think it's WSL install, it says, okay, what do you want to do? We'll say WSL install help. And it's asking me, how do I want to go install a particular version of, of, uh, of a Linux? Let's go and do this. We'll say WSL install online. And I'm going to get a list of the ones. I can't remember what the command line was. I think it was dash dash online. But I want to make sure I'm going to install a distro. WSL dash dash install dash list. OK, let's try that. WSL dash dash install dash dash list. Uh, dash online. There we go. Dash O. Am I doing it wrong? Dash L. Dash O. I never remember the dash thing. You know, Linux, Mac, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But I always get confused about which um, about command line stuff. So maybe you can edit out me being an idiot at the command line. WSL dash dash install options. So now I feel like a dummy. You are going to edit this, I assume. Notice how he didn't say I'm going to edit this. He's thinking about <laughs> it. And that's fine. Oh, it's dash dash list dash online. Let's clear that. Try it again. Sorry. Now I feel like a schmuck. 
I was going to hoping to do this whole thing as like a um, one take, but now you're going to, there it is. Okay, so check this out. So WSL dash dash list online are other Linuxes that I could potentially install like live. So we could grab Kali Linux, right? So now I could go WSL dash dash install dash D Kali. It's a little hard also to turn awkwardly like this. Okay, so that's installing that. Now while that's happening, I'm going to click up here and I'm going to hold down Alt with one thumb and then I'm going to open up a split screen. It's kind of like Tmux or screen. And then I'll say WSL dash dash list, which will show me the local Linuxes. Right now I have Ubuntu as my default and I've also got Docker. But it's grabbing Kali at the same time. And then in a moment, Kali Linux is going to pop in here as another Linux. So I can have as many Linuxes as I want all running uh, side by side, and I can open them in as many panes or panels as I, as I want to do. And then one of the things that's interesting about that, if we, let's go ahead and close some of these panels. While Kali's loading over there, I'm going to come back over to here, close a few of these. I'm going to do a PWD, and I'm going to point out that we're in slash home slash Scott. Okay? Now this is interesting because it doesn't say C drive, right? If we do like a DF or something, you can see our file system, our Linux file system, but I want to call out these guys right here. We're not actually on the C drive, we're on the Linux file system. But what if I tried to run like a Windows executable from Linux? That's weird. Why would you want to do that? But I can do that. I can run Notepad and Notepad actually starts up because we are integrated with Windows such that when the Linux kernel sees the .exe, it goes, oh, I can't do anything about that. And then it gives Windows a chance to then go and do that, which means then I could potentially say explorer.exe dot, where dot is the current folder and explorer is Windows Explorer. And now look, that's my home screen and my, and my bash RC directly here. And you can actually see Linux in the corner. There's this PC and then there's Linux with its own tux right there. And then when Kali Linux shows up in a minute, look, it appears as its own distro within my Linux, which means that it's finished over here. Now I'll go and do a setup because it's installing Kali for the first time. And what it did is it brought a tar file down. This is really Kali and it, there, boom, there you go. Message from Kali. And there it is. That's the name of this machine. And that's my username on that machine. And I've got a full Kali Linux right now. And then if I come here, you can see it hasn't been detected yet by Windows Terminal. I'll close Terminal. I'll open it again. And then when I come back, I've got Ubuntu here, Kali there. It can have its own colors, its own style, or whatever. And it's totally integrated. And if I come back and say Ubuntu where I was before and do the PWD and point out, of course, that I'm in this Scott folder, um, we could potentially you know, go and bring some code over here and like clone some code. But I want to show the interaction model, the interaction between Linux and, and, and Windows. So I'm in Linux. Let's switch over to um, my work account and I'll log in to GitHub because I want to get a private repo. So here's a repository. I'm logged in as me. And you know, this is all, I'm making all this up as we go along. So maybe, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work, right? So here I'm going to use the GitHub CLI to go and do the cloning of that repo. But I want to do that inside of of Linux over here. I don't even know if I have the GitHub repo stuff installed. Okay, so it says that it doesn't have that installed. So I could go and snap it or do whatever, but we'll go and say GitHub CLI. Sorry, I'm doing it with my arms a little bit awkward, like turned like this. GH CLI install Linux. So we'll go and grab the CLI and that says download for Windows because it of course is detecting that I'm in a Windows browser. So I'm going to say view installation instructions, and we can do it in homebrew. There's actually homebrew for WSL now, but we're on Linux, so we're going to go and just get it the regular way. But it's in different repositories, so I can go and grab one of these repositories here and say, let's go and grab it on Ubuntu. So I'm just taking the straight Linux instructions right there, bringing it back over here, dropping it in, because it's Linux, do the update, it's going to bring down GitHub CLI. I know I'm vibing right now, but interrupt me because it's your show. And then we can say GitHub auth login. It's going to say, do you want to log into GitHub or not? I'm going to say yes. Now, when it says login with a web browser, it's going to do a process start, but it's Linux. So what's going to happen? Well, 
We go like that, it's gonna actually launch a browser, but it's trying to do it like this, see? It's trying to launch an executable because I don't have a browser installed here, right? But I can click directly on that thing in Windows Terminal, launch here, and I'm gonna grab this auth code and just paste it in. Authenticate against GitHub, trust the CLI, it's gonna go and add my SSH key. Now I have to grab my authy because I gotta do two-factor auth here. So hide my authy, I guess. Grab this, boom, 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 boom. Okay, come back over here, logged in, right? Now we'll do that clone again. Brought that down. Okay. So I've got my code, my .NET code or whatever from here. How would I edit it? How would I code this? Would I do, would I run like VI or something? I suppose I could, that's really VI. But a cooler thing to do would be to run VS Code. But I'm on Windows, but I'm on Linux. If I was just running it in a VM, I'd install VS Code in the VM, but then I'm not really running Windows. I'm running Linux in a VM. I'm running a square inside of another square. But what's cool about WSL and this style of, of interaction is you're watching me seamlessly jump back and forth between Windows and Linux because they're the same thing. If I type code dot, watch. It's actually installing VS Code server. What is VS Code server? It's split VS Code in half. The server side is gonna be all of the language, the language um, uh, LSPs, the language service providers, and it's going to be under WSL, but I'm running the UI of VS Code in Windows itself. So when I say control, you know, when I say like file open, that's the Linux file system, not the Windows file system. This terminal down here, or I can say, of course, show local, and then the Windows one pops up. So this means that I'm now doing the editing of my C-sharp application directly here on Linux, but this is a Windows application. So I can move seamlessly between WSL, Linux, Kali, Ubuntu, VS Code, .NET, and I'm not, nothing's slowing me down at any point. And even right there, you saw me install from a snap or from apt-get by updating, uh, install VS Code server, authenticating against GitHub, clone my .NET code, and boom, and it's running in, I don't know, like two minutes. I know that was like one big run-on sentence. I'm just really excited about it, so I apologize for not giving you a chance no, to talk. No, no. But I, did you know any of that was possible? I didn't. That's, that's pretty cool. cool. So yeah. that, that, that's awesome. Because sometimes people know this stuff, and I'm like, oh, shoot. You had no idea. No, I didn't know. It's all free. Nothing I showed you cost anybody money. If you have Windows, you have this. You can just type WSL dash dash install and it'll put all this stuff on your machine. VS Code we know is free, .NET's free. Um, the only thing I have here that uh, I guess that you're supposed to pay them is Docker Desktop, but I'm using the Community Edition for my community work. Um, and then uh, in this case here, I'm not actually running in Docker, but if I ran Docker, I could do the exact same thing and I could open up a, uh, a local container, what's called a dev container. Uh, another thing that I did that you don't often see on Windows, if you notice here, I've blinged out my, um, my prompt a lot so if I go over here to my, my D drive, and I want to point out two things. Notice that we've got my prompt here with the current folder. That's actually my blood sugar. I'm diabetic. Oh. And I have an implant in my arm right here. And I have an insulin pump right here. And I have an open source artificial pancreas. And my blood sugar goes Bluetooth to my phone, from my phone to the cloud, where I have a REST API. So that's my blood sugar that I can monitor in real time. And that's important to me because the most important things in my life right now are my blood sugar so I don't die, my current Git branch, and then the version of .NET that I'm running in the current folder. So as I'm moving around from place to place, you can see my prompt is pretty fancy. I'm able to see those things differ. And then also this right here, notice that little rocket ship if I go to the C drive, the rocket ship is gone. If I go to the D drive, the rocket ship is there. That's called a developer drive. A lot of people complain that Windows is slower for developers, but if you go over into uh, settings, into developer mode, use developer features on Windows 11, down here at the bottom, we have optimized developer drives that are not using NTFS, which is the 
file system that you're used to, right? On, on Linux, you use like ext4 or butterfx, as we call it, you know, butterfx, brtfs. Um, this is actually using a new one that's called REFF, REFS, the Reliable File System, that's only usually available on Windows Server. But what's cool about it is, is that a, it's a new file system, optimized for developers, it's free, it's built into Windows, and then we also change all of the antivirus stuff to be asynchronous, so we're not like scanning the code that you're compiling for viruses because you just compiled it and that slows down things. So you can get between 10 and 30% performance benefits with a dev drive, even if you're on the exact same SSD. So in this case here, I've got one two terabyte drive. I've made 150 gigs, one file system, and then I partition the rest this way. So if I go down into disk management here and show you my actual partition table, like this, this is like running DF on Linux. BitLocker encrypted corporate drive NTFS, ReFS, data partition, and then a little recovery one at the end there. So I've made my prompt light up when I'm on the faster drive so that I can know what's going on. So if I switch back over to my, my code and then compile my website, this is for my own personal website, with .NET build, uh, right now, we're gonna, I think I'm using a preview version of .NET, so this should be a clean build eight seconds. And that's my full, my full website on this machine here. And of course, I've also blinged it out with cool colors and, and icons as well, because who doesn't like a pretty prompt? That's cool. not, it's not like the windows you're used to. I assume that the windows you're used to probably looks like that. Yeah. And it's very sad. Yeah. It's, uh, things have changed, my friend. How do you do the colors? Okay. So there's a lot going on here. So this bottom part here, the prompt is called Oh My Posh. Right, kind of an homage to oh my ZSH. And these are individual segments and those are configured with JSON files. And oh my posh can be run on Linux as well or on Mac. So if you like that look, oh my posh dot dev, you can go up here, get that prompt engine. And what's great about this prompt engine is it works on any shell. It's shell non-specific. I'm using PowerShell, you might be using ZSH, it doesn't matter, use which one makes you happy go into Mac OS and install it, it's in Homebrew, and you can just grab it with Brew Install. These individual segments are written in Go, so we wrote that one to call my REST API. That's a Git segment, that's a .NET and Visual Studio specific segment, but you could have the weather, you could have the version of Node or whatever you're doing. This right here is PowerShell, and I've added coloring and icons, so if we go into VS Code and look at my profile, which is like your Bash profile except for PowerShell, I've installed modules like terminal icons that give me those icons. I put in read line, which gives you a more Linux-like experience at your command line. And then this one here called Z is a replacement for CD. You know, you see that I'm not CDing around, I'm typing Z. And that lets me have a nice history of everywhere I'm going. And I can switch to those things really quickly, which is cool. Isn't that fun? Yeah. So it's cool partly because in my previous interview, I was talking to someone from Charm, Charm CLI. Oh, cool. And it, it sounds like it, it's a little bit similar to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's look at Charm CLI, right? So all these different CLI, was it, was it Charm, you said? Yeah, Charm.CLI. Charm. Charm.SH, Char, Charm I think. Charm.SH. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so all of these different kinds of command line things that glamorize a command line, I feel like Windows users have been left out of that story for a long time. You know, you, you are a Windows user and you, you, you go to a website for some open source and then their prompt doesn't look like that and you're like, oh, well, I guess my prompt isn't fun anymore and I can't go and run that cool tool. Well, now you can and I can run them side by side. So if I go here and say, I wanna open up Ubuntu and I wanna start running Charm or I wanna run Homebrew, there's no homebrew for, for us, right? Well, I'm running WSL, I can say homebrew WSL, homebrew on Linux, is literally the homebrew package manager that runs on Linux, but also on Windows. So now I'm a part of the homebrew family. So I don't feel left out anymore as a Windows user. I can do whatever I wanna do with any of these different kinds of things. And if I go back, actually, let me show you this, this will surprise you. Let's go back over here for a second. Let's see if I have .NET in my Linux machine. I'm gonna make this larger for you. 
we'll go into my podcast. I'm just going to see if I can run this, but I don't, I don't actually know if I have .NET installed. So we could go and install .NET like this, which is nice, again, to be able to go and do these different snaps and app kind of things. Okay, so they're telling me that they don't want me to use that one. Um, I won't be able to do that from here right now for the purposes of this demo, but I want to show you that I could start up a... Actually, let's try this. I don't know how long are your videos, man. Is this already the weirdest one you've ever done? No, it's it's not. It's it's really cool. I think. Is it cool? You're not you're not you're not sad, because no. I was nervous. If I was sad, I would stop. You would stop it, and you'd be like, "Dude, this is not what I wanted." Right. Okay. Cool. So what I'm doing is I'm just going over here, and I'm going to go and say install .NET on Ubuntu. I want to grab supported versions, and I'm going to grab the. Uh, the copy paste. Go and do an update real quick. Grab .NET. So the reason I'm showing you this is not just to show you how I'm easily I'm able to move Windows to Linux, but I want to point out again that this is Windows Visual Studio Code. I'm using the Windows browser. But if you had a VM, you have to think about networking and how these things all fit together. Let's go and see if .NET started up. So if I'm going to go and run something like .NET from the command line, here we go. Let's go and say .NET run. There you go. So I've got, I just installed .NET 7 live on a Linux machine that I just cloned that code live because I don't do fake, fake demos. Um, and it's thinking, let's go do this actually. While I'm wondering what it's thinking, we might be talking to the network right now. So what you can do, yeah, you can see the network is actually shared Oh, here we go. What is it saying to me now? Oh, this is a this is a .NET ism. So they're saying uh, .NET version six, and we found version seven. So they're asking me how I want to fix this problem. This is actually a more of a .NET thing. What kind of dev or what kind of code do you write if you're not a .NET person? Uh, Python. Mostly JavaScript. Python. Yeah. So we have a version issue here. Like you got a Python two app, and suddenly you got to turn it into a Python. Um, uh, you know, Python 3 app. I probably those, those days are probably over for you guys. But um, I'm just checking my versions of .NET real quick because um, it's saying I've got a wrong version. Give me one second here. I want to open up that csproj file. This is what happens when you do live demos. I'm very fascinated to see how you end up editing this or you just throw the whole thing out there. Grabbing an extension real quick. So what I'm trying to solve is this app right here wants to run version 6, and I just installed version 7. So I thought I'll just go and take a moment, and I will um, update my application to, uh, to, to this version. But because I'm awkwardly turning my head this direction, I'm having trouble figuring out where my file is. I want to open up this project file. CSCS proj. There it is. There we go. See where it says .NET 6? I'm going to just change that to 7 real quick. See if this will... I'm going to save us a little time. Otherwise, i got to mess around in Linux and go and install multiple versions of .NET side by side. So I was going to point out when I came here, you can see that it's talking to the network. This is like, you know, using top using Task Manager, you expect to see these things at the same time. Here we go, look, project is not compatible with .NET 6, that's fine. The, um, there's three projects in this um, family of projects in this solution. So I'm just building one of them. Right now it's complaining that one of them doesn't want to build because it's a, uh, a test application. And it's going out to the network and updating the packages. Those packages are like pip packages. We call them NuGet packages. Just like using a pip install, we're doing a pip install, except we're using conference Wi-Fi right here. So we'll see um, how long that's going to take. There it is. It's done. So two of them failed and one of them succeeded, but I only needed the one to succeed because for the purposes of this demo. So what I want to do is say .NET run, get this one thing to run. Again, trying to save me some time. There we go. That's what I wanted to show you. So we're on Linux, on Windows, and we just opened up localhost 5000. So in your mind, what you know, which is now 15 minutes of Windows and Linux, what is localhost in this context? It's for the VM, right? It's not 
on the windows. Right, and that's that's weird. Now I have to think about, is this natted behind yeah. something? Like, is this a nested dolls where I've got my Windows machine and I've got my, my Linux machine? So what we can do is I can run an application called TCP View, which is a utility from Sys internals that will allow me to basically see all my ports. And you know the Linux commands for these kind of things. And I'm gonna just drop in a sort and we're gonna go and look for port 5000. And I'm gonna point out WSL relay on port 5000 is automatically exposing that. So it's kind of like tail scale, but it's just exposing anything on the internal VM that it noticed within user space at a reasonable, uh, like 8080 or 8000 or anything like Node or Python or Django would start up. It's exposing that outward. So I want to be able to then just click on localhost 5000 and have localhost 5000 be local. So that's now the local version of my podcast from Windows. I said localhost 5000 in the Windows context, which hits WSL Relay, which then bounces down. But I didn't have to do anything. And then if you're familiar with TailScale, which is Wireshark networking, I could then have my, my Linux machine have TailScale, my Windows machine have TailScale, and my iPhone have TailScale, and then put them all on the same mesh network. And even though we're not on the same Wi-Fi, I could then hit the name of this computer, the name of this tail scale node, and test my podcast site on Linux, running under Linux, which is exactly where it's going to run when I put it in the cloud, except I can test it from my phone and then see the mobile version of that. So localhost 5000 in this context works exactly as you would expect it to work. Isn't that hot? And then look, there's the back end. That's really weird, but... It, Isn't that cool, cool. though? Yeah, but it's, it's like cool. It's the way it should work. Yeah. That's what you would expect. So then the weird part would be then if I opened up Kali, which we just installed live, and I opened up a 5000, it might work in Kali, but it would fail on the, on the exposing. I wouldn't be able to open it up all the way out because someone's already in that space because that TCP space right here is gonna get shut down. So I'm gonna close this by hitting Control C, and then you can see it just died. So that red 5000 just closed on that machine, and then Kali would be able to use it. You can set the networking up any way that you want, but it's really, really powerful. But from a pure developer's comfort perspective, I sat down here on a fresh machine that I haven't looked at in a while. I didn't even realize I hadn't installed GitHub auth, GitHub command line, I installed it live, auth live, cloned live, didn't have .NET, installed that live, ran it, and opened it up in localhost 5000 without actually being prepared for this podcast. I'm sorry, I should have been more prepared. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's, it's cool to see the installation process and everything. Well, I just, because I like showing real stuff because people come with like canned demos and that's stupid. And I don't like to do that. So yeah. Right. You're pretty nice. quiet for a podcast host. I feel no, like I'm over, I'm just I've overwhelmed you. I no, no, I'm just listening. Oh, you're very kind. I appreciate that. So do you have any questions about any of the stack? Because I've showed you dev drives, oh my posh, Windows terminal, WSL, code. Dev containers, there's a lot there. Right. Uh, so, you know, a quick comment I have is one of the reasons why I switched out of Windows was because, you know, I wanted to code on Linux like mm -hmm. environment, like a Unix like yeah, yeah, yeah. environment. And what I ended up doing was I ended up doing, you know, dual boot. And oh, that's yeah. kind of a problem because on Linux, you don't get a lot of, you know, Windows software. So I thought, you know, Mac would have both. But it seems like with this, you really have you know, the best of the both worlds. Yeah, you really do. And I'll even show you something else that'll freak you out a little bit. So like here I've got my, you know, my browser and then I've got VS Code right here. I'm gonna have a four finger swipe, which is known on Mac people, right? Four finger swipe. This is a surface right here. And I've got my terminal full screen by hitting Alt, Enter. And you can see that I opened up a virtual desktop down there. So that virtual desktop could then be named you know, call that like the dev desktop. And I can switch between dev and whatever, just like on a, on a Mac. But I can also do something else that might be interesting. I think there was the, the what's that thing, Photoshop for, um, for Linux, the GIMP? Install the GIMP on Ubuntu. Install GIMP, Ubuntu. Sudo apt install dash Y GIMP. So that should be just a straight install. So let's go back over to Ubuntu for a second. And let's drop in here and let's so sudo apt install GIMP. So 
So this will just take a second. So the GIMP, though, is an X Windows application. And then that starts getting really squishy. Because in the past, if you were running something in a VM, traditionally, whether it be VMware or you know, even Parallels, you have to start thinking about, how do I want to get it out into Mac space? You can run an X server. You can forward your X uh, display outwards. That can be uh, possible, but it's also somewhat of a hassle. WSLG, Windows Subsystem for Linux Graphics Edition, not only sets that up for you and makes it easier, but also it uses Wayland instead of X Windows, so it's a much more accelerated uh, technique, which means I can actually compile and run even games and run them under like um, a, a 3D accelerated world. Or I could even do machine learning or use my, my this actually has an NVIDIA uh, 40, 4060, I think this laptop does. So I could use the dedicated GPU from that VM because it's not really a VM, it's kind of a lightweight utility VM. Is so it a container? It's not a container. It's not a container. So there's, there's Hyper-V, which is the base part of the Windows, like how VMs run on Windows. And then there's the Hyper-V client that runs when you do things in a square. And you're like, hey, this is like Parallels or VMware. Uh, this is a, a lighter weight custom Hyper-V layer that actually works, by the way, on Windows Home, which is important because Hyper-V only runs on Windows Pro, but a lot of students use home. So if you have home at home, you can do everything I'm showing you. You don't require a fancy version. And that, that VM memory, uh, instead of just allocating a big chunk and then firing up the entire VM, it starts up in about two or three seconds, as you saw. And the memory squishes and um, comes and goes. And then when we run containers in Docker, the containers run in that utility VM as little containers. So it's a... Um, a compartmentalized, tiny, utility, lightweight VM that then the containers run within. So when you run Docker containers on Windows, you're running them on Linux on Windows. So here I just ran the GIMP, and what's interesting though is that, look here, in the Windows Start menu here, okay, Kali Linux recently added, just a few minutes ago, the GIMP suddenly showed up. The icon for a, an Ubuntu application just showed up in Windows Start menu with a little tux next to it. So if we run that, that's now a Linux application. And I want to zoom in here and I want to make really, really clear. That's, look at the cursor. That's the Windows cursor. And then you see how smooth that is. That's now the Linux cursor. When I go open, that is the Linux file system. But then if I want to get into the Windows file system, Right, we can go to the C drive and now that's my Windows file system. So I'm seamlessly moving between them. And in this case, running a graphical application that I like running, and you saw me install live. Right, this I'm familiar with because it's it seems like traditional WSL. This was added, this WSL didn't ship with WSLG. It was okay. added years later. Okay. But I'm glad that you've seen it. Right. And the fact that you can both move seamlessly as you see me doing, both in textual apps, container-based apps, or, or graphical apps is cool. Mm, so yeah. I'm glad. Yeah, I mean, to me, the weirdest part is what you showed me on with VS Code. Yeah, you like it's, that? It's a VS Code app on Windows that has access to Linux right. file system. That's Yeah, and what's strange. cool about that is that if you look down here in the corner where it says WSL, we have an extension added into VS Code for connecting to WSL or with specific distros. So I might want to say, open up a new window, come down here and say, connect using a specific distro and then switch to Kali. Now, Kali Linux doesn't have any of that stuff because you watched me install it live. So down here, you can actually watch that it's probing the shell environment, it's downloading Node and all of the things that it needs, and it's installing basically a language server, so that we might now attach to Kali Linux. So the same that same Visual Studio we had here, we've got one doing Ubuntu, and then we've got one over here doing Kali. And you can see down in the corner. Did you say the that language? one's on Kali? That one's Ubuntu. And the language server is the IntelliSense, right? So like the, like like if you were going to install Python and you want to get like PyLance to do your linting. Where should that run? In what context should that run? It should run in the Linux context because that's the context by which you're running your Python, right? 
So for example, let's 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 do this. Let's go back over and let's do file uh, open folder, and uh, we'll just open up a main folder here. And if I go out here, let's see if I actually have any Python on this machine. Do I even have Python? This is inside of Linux. Okay, so we don't have Python installed, so I'd have to go and install Python. But what I want to show you is the, the syntax highlighting, the coloring, like when you do that, is done by a language server. It's not VS Code that's doing that. It's like PyLance is going to lint it and put the squiggles and stuff. So VS Code, the UI runs here, but then the extensions, some are installed locally, like my Beyonce theme. It's called Beyonce. And some are installed inside of Ubuntu. So these, this C Sharp extension is installed here. So that means that I could run my Python app on a Windows machine that doesn't have Python installed. Python would be installed in the WSL context. And then you would have different extensions based on what you were going to use. So instead of just having 50 installed local extensions, I might just have three installed inside of here. And then if I go and pick another one, let's go and say, let's get a Python extension or PyLance actually might be good. Right? See, there's a drop down now. If I say install, it's, it should ask me where it wants to install this. Or I guess in this context, it might just install it directly inside. I was expecting it to pop up a thing that would say install in Windows or install in, in um, Oh, interesting. So this is new feature. They used to pop up a thing that said, hey, you want to be in Windows? You want to be in Ubuntu. But what it's doing is it actually installed PyLance in Ubuntu. So it looks like the UI people changed it because it's like more intuitive. I'm in Linux. I guess they would assume I wanted that inside of Linux. But the reason that that's interesting is if we go back over here and look at our extensions list, and we go back to just the ones that are installed, I don't have PyLance installed locally. It is only installed as a part of Ubuntu. Isn't that cool? That's really cool. So actually. then the IntelliSense for Python comes from Python running over there. And we can prove it. We can prove it, check this out, by going into Ubuntu and doing running HTOP. And you can see the sockets that are opened. And we can go and search for, there it is, VS Code Server right there. You can see node is actually started. There's multiple node processes. So it's almost as if it's a, um, a little REST API. It's not really REST. It uses a thing called language server protocol. But imagine, 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 imagine that you're typing something and you go object dot, and then it drops down the pop, you know, the IntelliSense. That's the moment when it calls out to the server across processes, which you've already seen is easy to do. And then now you have location transparency for your extensions. They can run on Windows, they can run in both places, or they can run, in this case, inside of Linux. That code server is running over there inside of Linux, providing that context. So then when we go back over to VS, grab some code. Let me just grab, what am I at here? Um, I'm just going to try to open up some file here. Do, 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 do. So I think uh, we probably get the idea of you know this whole setup. Yeah, it's cool. I like and it. I think it's cool because it gives you a lot of options. You know, you can write code on Windows or on Linux. What do you usually use? I'm on Windows 11 all the time. But when I am coding new stuff that I know is going to go in the cloud, because I run everything in containers in the cloud, I start in WSL. So my blog, my podcast, Azure Friday, all of my 11 or so websites are running in Linux containers in Azure. So I code with whatever I'm going to deploy to. Right. So if you know that it's going to be in a Linux container, you start coding on Linux. Yep. And then you basically just, uh, like, I guess, push the container code to Azure and then it runs there. Yeah, exactly. And in that context, I do it in two different ways. I have, in this case, I've got uh, those repositories that I just showed you. For example, my blood sugar meter or some of these other things all have uh, GitHub Actions. And, and then for some of them, I'll use Azure DevOps 
to go and put that container up into the cloud. So if I log into Azure DevOps, I push from Linux on Windows up into GitHub, that calls a webhook that either tells an action to start, or in this case tells uh, these guys to run, grabs a Docker container, and then sends it up. One other thing I can do though that I haven't shown you is I can run Docker on Windows. So I'm bringing that up now. I'm gonna go ahead and minimize a bunch of stuff because it's getting a little crazy. So here's Docker spinning up. And then I, I write my scripts in PowerShell, just like you would probably write yours in like Bash. So if I switch over here, for example, and I'll show you a script. I write them in PowerShell because PowerShell can run on both Windows and on, um, and on Linux. So here's an example script. See all these here? Docker build, Docker run, they're all PS1s. And if we open up one of those, You can see it's got a shebang using PowerShell on Linux or it has an extension which uses PowerShell on Windows. So the same script runs on both places. And even though this is a simple script that just says Docker build tag, I could have more sophisticated ones where I'm running tests using Playwright. You ever use Playwright? Yep. Right, so then I've got headless tests and headed tests to spin up and those tests will run on Windows, on Linux or headless inside of Docker. Which then means if we return back over to as an example, um, Azure DevOps, if I go into one of my build pipelines for the podcast site, just grab one from a couple of days ago, I can go into one of those running jobs and I can see where we actually ran the playwright tests headless inside of that environment. So I know that everything runs everywhere. I'm developing on Linux, but I also want to reserve the right to not run in a container to run on Windows, to run in Kubernetes. Like I just want flexibility. So then I run a matrix of tests that ensures that it runs on every browser and on every operating system, both server side and client side. And then these nice. scripts run in both places. So, okay, all, all of this is really cool, but I feel like for you know, people who are just getting started, they might feel overwhelmed, you know, they might be uh, used to coding on, let's say, a Oh, Mac. you're right, I feel yeah. bad. Now I've spent an hour Talking no. about stuff that's more 300 level. No, it's it's cool, but how how would you recommend that people get started? You know, do you recommend uh, first of all Windows, Mac? Yeah. Does it matter? So I recommend that you learn how to code. And I apologize, I should have done that at the beginning of the thing. I should have been more low level. And I apologize. You should use whatever machine you have. If you have a Mac and that's what you have available to you, you're going to be great. It's going to be fine. If you have a Linux machine or a Windows machine it's gonna be fine as well. The reason that I show this stuff on Windows is I want people to know that Windows can do things for them for free without them having to buy a new computer. You might have mom or dad's old Windows 10 machine. You can go into the store, the Windows store, and you can get for free the Windows terminal, which you might already have on your machine. And that's a great way to learn the command line. So I just go right into the Windows store and I grab the Windows terminal. That gets me into the command line. Then from the terminal, I can just start up whichever one they give me by default, which will probably look like this. And you can type WCL install. That'll get you Linux. So in two steps, anyone on any machine can get into a Windows command line and learn or a Linux command line and learn. So that's cool because then you're, uh, you know, you're going to free code camp or you're learning and you go and see a prompt that looks like that at your favorite learning resource or your website or your, your, your YouTube, and you don't feel left out because you're like, oh, that dollar sign means that I can type ls to get my directory. Well, this dollar sign, you know, this, this prompt means I type dir. And then you can learn both Linux and Windows in an environment that you already own. Right, and do you think it's easier than dual boot? Yes, 100%. So I think that that's funny because I felt I feel a little bad that I got too advanced too fast for the, for the for your audience, but you're making a really great point. To even learn that dual boots a thing is uh, is a is a gate to jump over. It's a challenge for someone to understand because now you're thinking about partitioning disks and whether you're booting into a VHD or whether you're booting onto another partition. I think disk partitioning is challenging for anyone to learn. But this requires no disk partitioning. It doesn't change your hard drive in any way. It's free and easy. And if I switch over to Linux, because I do a dual boot, how do I get my code to the other partition? Yep. I put it on a USB 
or I don't have good connectivity or I have you know, unreliable internet at the house, do I push it to GitHub and then bring it back down? This is very clean where I can go explorer.exe and I can grab my code and just copy paste it from Linux to Windows. I can copy paste. So your examples can be copy pasted from, from the browser directly into the command line or directly into VS Code. Dual booting is just wasting time. I think dual booting is how we would have done it maybe 10 years ago, but not now. Right, I, I remember that. That's how I did it 10 years ago. I yeah, did no longer, because it's no fun. It's one more thing you could mess up. Let, okay. Let's go into actually C sharp on .NET. Okay. Yeah, so let's, let's, go, let's start with the basics. What is .NET? <clears throat> what is C sharp? Okay, you've yeah. been very patient and I thank you for that. Okay. Okay, so. Microsoft is not really good at naming things. I think that's a fair statement. And when .NET came out, the idea was you'd have multiple languages and they would all run on the .NET runtime. However, Java runs on Java and that was really easy. C Sharp runs on .NET, so the Java runtime and the .NET runtime. Java runs on Java, C Sharp runs on .NET. There's other languages in C Sharp like F Sharp and Visual, and Visual Basic. But C Sharp is kind of the first among equals, just like you've got Java and Scala and Groovy on Grails and all other Java things in the Java ecosystem, but Java's like the first among equals. C Sharp is a C-based language, a curly brace language that feels Java-y, it feels like C, it feels like C++. Um, so if you are familiar with any language that has curly braces, you're gonna go, oh, okay, I kind of I kind of get that. You can go to the .NET website, which is actually dot.net. That's our website, .net. And I've got a whole series of videos to walk you through step by step, but you can even get started by trying it directly in the browser. So you don't have to install anything. So I just went there, I said learn, and I went to this in-browser tutorial, right? So I'll change that to hello friends and I'll hit run code and it compiles in the cloud and I can immediately start playing. Nice. I've installed nothing. You can do this on a Chromebook. Right. So anybody they, who wants to do this can just go up here and go to the learning center to the in-browser tutorial. Right. And then the next step is learning about strings and running those yeah. strings and then going to the next one, yeah. all in the browser. And from a higher level perspective, what can you do with .NET and C Sharp? And should I, should I even say them together, .NET and C Sharp? Okay, so that's a great point. So we're not good at naming things. C Sharp is the language, .NET is the community. Let's call it that way. Um, C Sharp runs anywhere. So you can make web apps, you can make mobile apps, iPhone apps. These are native iPhone apps, native Android apps. You can is write- it Xamarin? Yeah, right. Xamarin, or, or now it's called MAUI, the Maui. multi-application UI. Microservices, you can also run it on a Raspberry Pi. So if you have a Raspberry Pi lying around, we have a whole IoT section where you can talk to sensors on your Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can run, them on, run it on anything, okay? Uh, it's, Unity, right? Unity is a great one. So if I wanna go to game development, you've got lots of game engines. Unity is just one of them, right? You've got Monogame and Godot and Stride. These are CryEngine, all of these different languages. So if you're playing games today, chances are they were all written using C Sharp. Right, yeah. Even I, I if know. you don't see it. Right. So I know Unity is a popular one. I think they do show Unity usually when, when the game start, starts up. Yep. Uh, so uh, so I if see it pops sometimes. up and says Unity, that's definitely it. Yeah. But yeah, Godot is another great one. You can do all kinds of uh, games, whether they be on Xbox, on Windows, on Mac, on Linux, or on any of the devices. So yeah, there's Steam Deck games that are running C Sharp today. If it pops up and says Unity, it's definitely doing that. So um, there really isn't anywhere you can't run right. .NET. And it's Popular for certain enterprise applications too, right? Yeah, so C Sharp about 20 years ago really got started in big enterprises. So you'll find a lot of legacy code that's like 15, 20 years old. About, about 10 years ago when we went open source, we kind of split and we had .NET and then we had .NET Core. And that word core kind of stuck because it was a, a smaller version of .NET. But now it's just .NET. So if you go and say download, we're on .NET version eight, actually. Version, by the time this video comes out, version eight will have come out. We release a new version every November. And we alternate between 
a long-term support and a short-term support, just like uh, Ubuntu, right? So like 2004 is a long-term support, 2204 is a long-term support, .NET 8 will be a long-term support, which means you can write the code and it'll be supported fully for like three years plus. And it's all free. VS Code is free, the C Sharp Developers Kit is free. So if you wanted to get started, I would go and say download.net on whatever, Lin Linux, Mac, or Windows. I would then get download Visual Studio Code. And then from Visual Studio Code, you go to extensions and you search for C Sharp. And you're gonna wanna grab the C Sharp Dev Kit. And that'll give you everything you need to be writing C Sharp and doing Hello World. And then if you go to dot.net at the video site, we've got a brand new uh, video series, 19 videos, basic, basic, basic. It's actually, we finished it last week. Nice. So we're at GitHub Universe right now, and I don't know when this is gonna come out, but in the next week or so, you'll be able to find those on the .NET website. Cool. And they're brand new, brand new videos that are gonna teach you how to do right. this directly from. So, you know, VS obviously uh, C Sharp is just one of many languages. When should people learn C Sharp? You know, People think too hard about what language that they want to pick. They, they, they worry about it too much. Like, I grew up speaking English, right? What did you grow up speaking? Japanese. Japanese, right? So did you ever, like, feel bad about your first language? No. No, it's your first language. And then you learn two, and then you learn three. Um, uh, my son is 15, and he's learning Japanese, and he's learning Spanish. And we were in Finland. You ever been to Finland? Uh, no. Okay, there's about five million people in Finland. And they were speaking Finnish, which is a very strange language. And he said, why are they bothering? Why are they bothering to learn Finnish? It's not going to win. That was, and I said, that's a wrong way to think about it. They like their language. It makes them happy. They write poetry in their language, right? That would be, it would be ridiculous for me to say, why are you bothering with Japanese? Why don't you just learn English? That is like saying, why am I bothering with Erlang or Go or Rust or whatever? Pick the language that makes you happy because it makes you happy and then learn another one because it will make you happy as well. And poetry in Japanese feels different than poetry in, like they call it haiku for a reason, right? That's just one kind of Japanese poetry. You can write C sharp, you can write Java, you can write Python and you'll say, wow, this feels like a native wrote it and then you'll become a native and then you'll right. share it with other people. Yeah. So don't worry about your first language. Pick one, and have fun cool. and pick two. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so what's so special about C Sharp? I like C Sharp because every time I find a new platform that I want to write for, I go, oh gosh, I'm going to have to learn another language to do that platform. And then I find C Sharp runs on it. So like I, Raspberry Pis came out and everybody was on Raspberry Pis doing Python. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll learn Python. And that's cool. I know some Python, but I really know C Sharp. So then when C-sharp starts running on a Raspberry Pi, I'm like, ah, I'm very welcome, right? Like if you meet someone out in the world and they speak a language you speak, you're like, ah, that's cool. And it makes you feel good about your language. You're excited right. when someone learned your language. So I use C-sharp because I can run it anywhere. When Kubernetes came out, I'm like, oh, I got to learn Go now. I don't. C-sharp runs in Kubernetes. It runs in containers. I so it makes that. me, yeah, it works that's great. Cool. It makes me yeah. feel comfortable. It, it sounds, you make it sound a little bit like JavaScript because, you know. Yeah, that's a great example. There is there's, uh, React Native and there is, uh, you know, a platform for desktop apps with JavaScript. So .NET is kind of the same thing, like mobile, desktop, yeah. web. So this is a great thing. example, right? Let's think about all the languages that run everywhere. Go, Python, Rust, JavaScript, C Sharp. We're in a situation where we're not competing with everyone all the time. Now it's co -opetition. We're cooperating and we're competing. And yeah, parts of Kubernetes are written in Go. I can run my C Sharp there and I can have my microservice call your Python microservice call her JavaScript microservice. And that's okay. It's a universal translator now and the internet is the important part. So beginners should learn the internet and understand HTTP and understand how to call websites and make websites. And the language underneath, whether it be JavaScript or Python or C Sharp will work itself out. Nice. Um, like you don't just drive only like a Honda. Right. You can drive a Toyota. You can drive a Ford. People need to be able to do that as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think just uh, since we need to wrap up. They're uh, kicking us just, out. Uh, one quick question, uh, if you're okay with it. 
Um, so mobile, you know, I think that's straightforward. Xamarin or whatever it's called now. Uh, web and and uh, you know Unity too. It, it runs on mobile. Yeah, yeah. Uh, web and mob, web and desktop. How does it work with .NET? So .NET can use different frameworks. So the .NET family or C sharp language can work on any different uh, framework. So just like with Python, there's different ways to write GUIs, graphical user interfaces. You can use Avalonia. You can use WPF. You can use WinForms. You can write applications using these different libraries. On the web side, we use ASP.NET. Right. So like Python uses Django. Yeah. C Sharp uses ASP.NET, and you can write websites. And then we have Razor and Blazor, and those are different frameworks for writing applications. So this page that we're looking at here is actually an ASP.NET Razor page. Right. Yeah. Not the front end, right? The front end is in JavaScript. The front end is in uh, is is in JavaScript, but the JavaScript would have been generated by C Sharp, which is a longer conversation. We can generate right. what's called WebAssembly now. So you write oh, the yeah. code in C Sharp. And you don't have to write JavaScript at all if you don't want to. That's so strange. That's another show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. I think I I learned a lot. Hopefully, yeah. the listeners will too. Yeah, I'm happy to meet again, and we can talk more detail and and, and more more focused. Yes, that that would be great. Maybe online or yeah, absolutely, offline, whatever works. All cool. right, thanks, thanks so for much. Having me.